Hello, welcome. Bonjour, eh, bienvenue. Hello a todas. Antes de comenzar mi charla, uh, me gustaría en noviembre brevemente algunas personas por su ayuda con respecto al Congreso Picasso. Gracias al Comité Científico por invitarme, especialmente José Lebrera Stals y Pepe Camal. Gracias a Ramón Melero Guirado por su ayuda con los, los detalles del Congreso. Mi agradecimiento especial a Ned King y al personal de la Tate Modern de Londres por su ayuda, consejo y permiso para reproducir pinturas específicas de Picasso. Como siempre, gracias a Anne Francois, Salvador, Harold y Ima. Naturalmente, con mi terrible español, voy a dar mi charla en inglés. Abro, abro con un clip corto del director Henri-Georges Clouseau, uh, Le Mister Picasso. Oh, can I play? Can I lower the lights just a little bit, please? Some observations about the film. One, Picasso was far more interested in the process of painting. I want to go deeper, he says, 52 minutes into filming. I want to show all the different stages of the painting. Two, the earliest stages of work, flowers, fish, rooster, later transformed into a fawn, remain despite later renditions. Painting, like film, is documentation. It preserves Picasso's first vision. Finally, painting has both a preservative and a destructive drive. It guides and shapes Picasso's art. All this is today's focus. New scanning techniques of Picasso's paintings are revealing numerous underlying subjects. Here, X radiograph results disclose that a landscape accounts for some of the textural differences in the final portrait. Now, it's unlikely the underneath is by Picasso because a certain Torres Gonzalez signs the sketch. Neither does a shortage of materials account for hidden presences. As Anne Honingswald explains in Tragedy, preliminary forms often influence the result. 
the underlying fundamental to its structure and subject. The practice is habitual. Take recent analysis of girl in a chemise. Even in breaking light, a boy's face and hair are visible rather than those of the girl. His costume, the collar, is absorbed into hers, the lacy neckline. Examination of the underlying reveals a surface like a painted wall, disclosing a patania of age. So conservation science is therefore contributing to the formation of an archaeology for each painting investigated. What might this mean for Picasso's painting? Fittingly, these buried wrecks allude to documentation, authenticates handed down to history for decryption. As Picasso suggested of this particular work, quote, maybe one could still see it if one radiographed the painting. The practice is analogous with DNA science. A blood test from which an analysis and diagnosis can be made of what I was at those instants, Picasso quantified. Underpaintings in three nudes suggest manuscript-type documentation, originally depicting a Stein-esque seated figure. Redrafting, however, discloses Picasso's image, feminized and melded with Stein's. Here, the drooping hand and lotus pose of Picasso absorbs her latent presence. The underneath, allied with surface text, evokes what Christine Poggi calls the palimpsestic structure of Picasso's painting. It reveals throughout 1906, 08, a stunning array of partly erased, overdrawn, interpolated, hybrid and commingled bodies and objects. The purpose served, me thinks, is to archive the ed essences of multiple figures and states. Listen to remarks made to Zervos. Quote, do you think it concerns me that a particular picture of mine represents two people? The vision of them gave me a preliminary emotion. Then little by little, their actual presences became transformed and have taken on the idea of two people and preserve the vibration of their life. Let's examine this statement, Re, the Stein portrait. Everybody knows this painting. It's very famous. Lucy Belloli's analysis confirms that while the body hardly altered, the visage was considerably amended. Months of reworking evidence Picasso's tendency to deface the original vision. But despite the destructive effect, however, the audio radiographs show that Stein's vibration is still intact. This purposeful effacement or absorption extends to sketches Picasso expressly intends the underlying to haunt the final image. As Robert Rosenblum has observed, figures of the period therein represent a sort of womb-like experience of an infant or embryo. Krauss suggests these regressive tendencies are a modernist condition of, quote, sightlessness or homelessness, an absolute loss of place. I think as well, it's Picasso's search for a place of origination in art, part of what I will call his archive impulse. Now, it's a state implied by this self-portrait. The thumb merged with the tetrachrome palette evokes pigments used by our distant ancestors. His rigid stance an atavistic countenance allied with the search for the origin. A picture comes to me from miles away, he once reasoned. Who is to say how far away I sensed it, saw it, painted it? We see the search in adaptations of the so-called spirit photograph, the double exposure leaving ghostly traces. But the prickly itch of Picasso's archive impulse is highly paradoxical. 
attempts to preserve the past and note that nostalgic recollections fill both images, uh, a reference to Casagemus in, in, in Picasso's self-portrait, slip away at the moment of creation. Picasso's note on the back of this particular work describing the circumstances of Canal's photograph reinforces archival yen and hankering for beginnings. In 1915-16, the desire is expressed by his tailor-made armour of embourgeoisement, tangibly stripped away to assert his original role as rude mechanical. Running the gourmet from Boulevardier to Brawler, Picasso winds back history. The archive principle parallels painting presented as evidence of what he was at those earlier instants. A parallel approach is taken in The Bull, where, like a butcher, Picasso cuts through the carcass, slicing it to the bone. The reversal of lithographic states from comparative abstraction to comparative complexity is pseudo-archival in its search for pure linear essence. On glass, or with light, painting becomes what Irvin Levine has called an object lesson in the history of art. The, the bull lithographs, the archive impulse, is a retrogressive, retrogressive destruction of a single work of art back to its original, perhaps ideal, state. Again, a contradictory need to preserve, overwhelm, to claw back the origin drives the work impulse. It's likely part of a contemporary upheaval regarding attempts to unveil obscure traces or states or forces. Some examples uh, should suffice. Freud, like an archaeologist, buried through stratums, shielding the unconscious, demonstrating that even the most significant impression leaves an unalterable trace, which is indefinitely capable of revival. Bergson suggested that we leave vestiges the past endured and prolonged into the present. Discoveries such as general relativity, quantum hypothesis, radioactivity, atoms and electrons all confirmed an invisible independent reality. In photography, discoveries used by Moybridge, Murray or Bragaglia reveal that quantum states hide in the everyday flux. Bragaglia's writing on futurist photodynamism even suggested that, quote, when a person gets up, the chair is still full of his soul. To get a sense of these invisible realities, let's view Mare's chronophotographic gun as a tool for capturing states not apparent to the human eye. I want that to play now. Will it play? Thank you. It's just a little visual break. Just relax.
I have to speak straight into the mic. So here, I think, art is brought closer to science. Imperceptible reality, a type of expressive energy or force, it's really there and reflects the epoch's fascination with all things invisible, where modern chimeras seem to be revealed to us. The visually inaccessible in science and photography was naturally linked with the quasi-scientific. French occultists need to prove what lies beneath may likewise have exacerbated Picasso's archival vehemence. Did the superstitious Spaniard, who feared death terribly, believe that art, like science, could eventually reveal supernatural phenomena, much like supposed spirit photographs? The imperceptible X-ray beam was similarly associated with the magical, Espana's cartoon is notable for what would soon become the stuff of cubism, labels, posters, trade cards, and covered by the new invisible science. The dappled areas in Picasso's Cadaque works certainly recall x-rays, discernible things, draw knobs, keys in locks, or a nail securing a pallet that keep cubism from being wholly incomprehensible, project like alien entities that X-rays dis disclose. Like X-rays, Picasso's cubism simultaneously elucidates through descriptive clues or readings of objects or obfuscates with fluctuating interpretations of words or signs. Here, the influence of a tribal mask is incongruously revealed by the syntax of his cubist-constructed guitar. It's one instance of, of the archive in sculptural form. In photography, the juxtaposition of naturalist works and unsettling grotesques demonstrates the archive's alternatively destructive nature. The studio installations run counter to chronology, stylistic categorizing, and historical continuousness. Photography balances orderly documentation against far more unruly forces, while objets d'art on the shelf continue what uh, a sort of mania for collecting all kinds of little things. Presences can take the form of dark spectres hiding in the shadows and threatening loss or destruction. I think there's a reference here um, uh, to Picasso's shadow. Um, uh, a particular author makes reference to that. Whether that's true or not, I don't know, but there you go. Um, so, this sort of ghostly um, symbolism finally brings us to three dancers. I'm going to finish with this now. New research reveals that painting began life in monochrome, likely an unfulfilled classical scene en grisal, comparable to the Three Graces, which is in Bernard's collection, uh, the one on the right, obviously. Um, it's highly possible because Picasso overwrote all his previous attempts. However, he left tiny sections of grey for all to ponder. When Penrose brought to his attention cracks in the paint on the left side, Picasso happily admitted that they added to the painting because they reveal the eye that was painted underneath. T.J. Clark notes that the blue of the window sealed with a red line likewise hides a huge right-facing profile opposite the supposed Pichot silhouette. If so, Picasso wheedles into the coarse matière a blue neoclassical avatar pushing its way up and into the back scene. Three dancers thus preserves the ghosts of the St. Raphael's pictures, but incongruously annihilates their blue and idealized Mediterraneanisms. We see this in the faltering surface that, that fails to suppress the ugly underneath. It's in the dance of death and the haunting phantoms in the window. This is Picasso's archive impulse a creative, preservative drive which nonetheless harbours an ever-present destructive threat. I'm nearly finished. Now, Freud's life and death drives articulated in Beyond the Pre Pleasure Principle may be vital. The aim of the former is to establish even greater unities and to preserve things. 
The aim of the latter is, on the contrary, to destroy things, Freud writes. Picasso's general approach to painting similarly prefigures Derrida's 1995 essay, Archive Fever, importantly subtitled, A Freudian Interpretation. According to Derrida, there is no archive fever without the threat of a destruction drive. This is infinite, he says. It sweeps away the simple, factual limits of conservation. To be on mal de chief is to burn with passion, Derrida declares. It is never to rest interminably from searching for the archive right where it slips away. It is to have a compulsive, repetitive, and nostalgic desire for the archive, an irrepressible desire to return to the origin, to a place of absolute commencement. This, as I've tried to show today, underscores Picasso's approach to painting. In the old days, pictures went forward towards completion by stages, he says. A picture used to be a sum of additions. In my case, it's a sum of destruction. It's a comment habitually used to explain his departure from traditional approaches to art. I do a picture, then I destroy it, the artist explains. But I think it points up the inherent archival nature of Picasso's work, aligning it at the same time with the historical process. Like history, a painting is never finished. It still goes on changing, Picasso says. And even though it is eternally threatened by a sum of destructions, in the end, Picasso stresses, nothing is lost. This compulsive drive to preserve, destroy, constitutes the archive in paint, where the historical fervor is literally in the making. So Picasso's mal de chief epitomizes the Hippocratic oath of painting in history to wage war on forgetfulness, loss, and finitude. Driving this was an obsessive need to archive, plainly in paint, and steering, one assumes, a lifelong artistic ambition. Thank you. <laughs>